Okay, I'm noticing now it's about um, 11.32 Eastern Standard Time. Um, so we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to everyone joining us from across the Americas region this morning and um, also some from Europe um, for this Navigating Decarbonization webinar. My name is Ian Duthie. I'm North of England's Director for the Americas based in New York City. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's time to get this going. Decarbonization is now one of the most critical challenges facing the maritime industry. Over the last 10 years, we've seen shipboard emissions become a front and center issue in shipping, influencing regulatory changes and all stakeholders in the industry. Decarbonization of shipping is by far the most complex and pressing area with the reduction of CO2 emissions requiring an industry-wide approach. At the Marine Environment Protection Committee meeting 76 in June of this year at the IMO, they set decarbonization targets for the shipping industry and the key dates for compliance are imminent. As these mandates will require close coordination, including sharing of information and communications across the industry, North is extending its free webinar series to members and friends, and we're happy to be joined again by our industry colleagues, the American Bureau of Shipping, who also have clients attending this webinar. ABS will discuss the technical side and specifically how ship owners and operators can prepare now. Of course, feel free to ask questions during the webinar using the chat function. And if you have any questions afterwards, we're always available to discuss them with you. As is customary for North, we have an actively updated area on our website dedicated specifically to decarbonization. Um, if you go to our homepage, um, simply go to the large intuitive search field, which is in the middle of the homepage, type in decarbonization, and you'll be taken to the content page and specifics um, around this information. And that's true of the, um, the vast library of content that North has on its website. Now, by way of a brief introduction of our speakers today, from ABS, Keegan Plascon serves as ABS's business development director. He's responsible for driving business growth in the marine and offshore industries, while also assisting ship owners and operators with meeting their classification and regulatory needs. Keegan's a graduate of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point and started with ABS in 2006 as a surveyor. Satirios Mamalis is the manager of global sustainability, fuels and technology at ABS. In this role, Soteria supports the development of products and services that promote decarbonization of marine and offshore vessels. His work on decarbonization is part of a greater ESG strategy focused on sustainability of the maritime industry. Before joining ABS, Soteria held academic positions, performing research on internal combustion engines, alternative fuels, and emissions technologies. He holds a PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Michigan. My colleague, Mark Smith, joined North in 2003, and he's on our loss prevention team. Mark previously worked as a fleet superintendent with Maersk, a technical superintendent with Pack Ship UK Limited, and spent time as an engineer at sea with P&O Ned Lloyd. Helen Barden joined North in 2012 and is in our Freight, Demerge, and Defense Department, FD&D. As well as supporting American, European, and UK members with their FD&D matters, Helen's an active member on North's sanction advice and maritime security expertise groups. Helen studied law um, with French at Leicester University, which included a year at the Jean Moulin University in Lyon, studying French and the legal practice course at Northumbria University, Newcastle, prior to being admitted as a solicitor of England and Wales in September 2008. Helen worked for the international law firm Eversheds LLP prior to joining North in September 2012. I began my career as a U.S. Navy Service Warfare Officer and U.S. Coast Guard Officer. Substantially, my career has been um, early on in the insurance business, working for uh, International Group P&I Club, and subsequently as head of commercial business and development for the NYSE listed Jones Act Company, International Shipholding Corporation. So that's it for me. I will now hand this over to my colleague, Mark Smith. Thanks very much. 
Thank you very much, Ian. Um, as we go throughout the rest of this presentation, yeah, if, I think the, the method we're going to use is that if you're on the screen at the time, please keep your video on. For those that aren't speaking, just blank the video off, please. Um, as we've said at the start of the presentation, um, if if there are any questions, please just put them into the chat function. We'll try and um, answer them as we go throughout the presentation, or if not, we can answer them afterwards. So great introduction from Ian, really got things going and really discussing the points at task here. So why are we here, first of all? That's really the question and what we're going to talk about. Well, the IMO has set a target for 2030 to reduce CO2 emissions per unit of transport work as an average across international shipping by at least 40% compared to 2008 levels. The EEXI, which is the existing energy efficiency existing ship index, is for ships above 400 GT gross tons. They will be required to calculate attained EEXI and meet a required EEXI, and an international energy efficiency certificate will come from this. We put some spanners here at the top and the really the reason is the spanners I'm just going to circle here is because it's a technical change. For those that are not familiar, it's a change you're going to make to your vessel and it's something that you know is going to make a physical change. It is expected that vessels must meet the required AXI by the first intermediate renewal survey um, or annual survey or special survey after the 1st of January 2023. And planning is the key here. And let's quickly talk about that. So the points to consider, first of all, what type of vessel and when was it built? Soterios and, and Keegan will go into that in further detail throughout their part of the presentation, but it has a massive impact on the vessels that are here and the vessels that you're dealing with. What are the trading patterns for the vessels and for how long? And what's the charter party duration? Helen will touch in a bit more on that throughout Helen's part of the presentation. Is power limitation an option? And what about service speed? And many will look at power limitation as an option because it's it's one of the cheapest options. It has the least impact. Um, but recently we've learned that the right ship GHG rating, for example, doesn't account for power limitation. And they look at other energy saving devices in, in, a, in a better light, let's say. Which improvement measure is best suited? That's another point. And, and as we say, there's many other different energy savers devices, whether it's, you know, Mewis duct or propeller, hull optimization, air lubrication, you name it, the list goes on. There's many other different options available. And really, it's not like one option can suit all. It really is bespoke to each vessel design and trading pattern. And then we look here at the cost of modifications and the time required. That has a major impact because if you can't take your vessel out of service or you haven't got a routine docking coming up, then you need to consider those points especially. So that's just EEXI in a nutshell, the technical side of it. We'll be going into this further detail throughout the presentation. This is just a basic overview at this moment in time. So let's look at CII, which is the carbon intensity indicator. And it's for vessels 5,000 gross tons and above, which is in line with the IMO DCS, which is the data collection system. And it's applicable to cargo, row packs, and cruise ships above the designed GT of 5,000. The proposal will require each vessel to have determined its annual operational carbon intensity indicator and the annual reduction factor needed to improve the ship's operational CII within a specified rating level is then determined. And that's that operational word we'd really like you to focus on here because it's an operational change. We looked at the EEXI before, which was a technical change, but this is operational and it's how your operations are handled effectively. There is certain crossovers when you look at speed limitation, but that's really in a little bit more detail than, than we're going to go into for this overview at the moment. So it's expected that a ship rated a D for three consecutive years or E for one year will be required to submit a corrective action plan to show how an improvement to meet the required index C or above will be achieved. And it's important to note 
that this will have a financial and an impact on chartering as well. The, these are important criteria, and they will have an impact. And we can draw some similarities with our symbol here to, uh, you know, domestic appliances, washing machines and the like. When we're purchasing a washing machine, for example, um, at least in the UK, we always look at the, the best grading and we've got a similar grading system here, which is the major superior, the minor superior, moderate, minor inferior and inferior. And we have what's referred to as an SAEMP, which is a ship energy efficiency management plan which needs to be updated by the 1st of January 2023. And then there's an annual statement of compliance review for, for this particular um, task as well. It's important to note as well that port authorities, administrations and other relevant stakeholders throughout the industry are actively encouraged to provide incentives to for vessels rated at A or B. So there's going to be a huge drive throughout the industry to make this work. On to the next slide here, and we tried to bring a, a schematic just to simplify because we you see that there's an incremental change per year of 2% per annum. And, and that can cause some confusion when you see the 11% reduction factor banded about amongst the marine press. So as you can see here by the schematic we created that you've got the 2023, there's a 5% reduction relative to the 2009 reference line that goes to 7%, then 9% and then 11% by 2026, which will be reviewed at that stage. Now, uh, further detail can be discussed on this, but there's various factors feed into the CII, which is your annual fuel consumption, your CO2 conversion factor. So the two are multiplied and then you've got your annual distance and distance traveled times your capacity, whether it's dead weight or gross tonnage. But that's something we will go on to in further detail at a later stage. And the CI, the IMO may take into consideration voluntary cargo reporting, but that's something that will come at a later stage. So now I want to forward thinking here and, and what's the planning? So forward thinking, first of all, there's been various research funds banded about and discussed, which we think is great, and we'd love to see more of that. So well, there's a USD 5 billion research fund by the IMRB, and that will more will be decided on that in an MEP 77. So we plan on running a webinar to follow up MEP 77 and stay tuned for that, because we think there's going to be quite a few developments there, which will shed some light on the rest of this. The EU and the US as well and other regionals are calling for their own decarbonisation systems, such as the ETS, which has recently been announced. And there's various other systems there to try and tackle this problem regionally. But obviously we have the IMO's targets, which are what we're looking at today. So let's look at it from a forward thinking perspective. We're talking about green shipping here, so we're concentrating on operational efficiency. For example, charter and port optimization, that's very important in just in time shipping. You know, we don't want to see container ships racing along at full speed to get to a port and sit there at anchor for two or three days. We need to see planning so that the vessels go there at the most economical speed, arrive, and they're not sitting around at anchor. The other disadvantage of sitting around at anchor is, of course, localised pollution. So it's something we want to try and avoid, and it's all to do with the planning, you know, all to do with the planning. Voyage optimization comes into this as well and feeds into the efficiencies here. And smart vessels and remote monitoring is very important here from that perspective too. Weather routing is, is taking place already and a lot of the vessels across the industry, and that will come to the forefront even more as we move to the next bit. And then the last point, all of these points are extremely important, but we want to highlight here the R&D working together. We want to see all industries, all ship owners, everybody working as closely together as possible, because that's where we're going to make the difference, really. It's not everybody working in their own silos. It's by everybody coming together, sharing the knowledge, sharing the experience and sharing their ideas. So that brings us on to this slide. Fuels of the future. Now you'll see a lot more as we go into the next period. And we're just going to talk about that very briefly at an overview. 
So infrastructure and bunkering is very important, and that will dictate to a certain extent the type of vessel you have, the type of fuel you use, and the trading patterns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That feeds into our next point, which is bespoke vessel design and, and trade specific. And then a really important point from loss prevention's angle is safety. You know, safety, crew training, expertise, and qualifications all come together with educating. And it's very important that they're, they're put together and we focus on those points because at the minute our crew are experienced with distillates, residual fuels, but they don't have the experience in some of the lower flash point fuels we're going to be dealing with. So those that are coming through the system now really need the expertise in these particular areas. And some companies, for example, you know, the larger liner operators are bringing in external LNG expertise in the senior ranks to try and organically spread it throughout the companies and the systems they're in. So whichever way your company looks to do it, we suggest that action is taking as early as possible to try and prepare for this and move in the correct direction. Quality control and specs. We're going to see concerns there. You know, as we've gone through IMO 2020, the you know, some may compare it to Y2K because there was less problems than expected. But from a PI club's perspective, we've seen plenty of problems with the quality of fuel, um, stability, et cetera, et cetera. So that's another problem. Contamination as you switch between different fuels is a major problem. And that's something that you, you need to be very wary of. And then we've got the regulatory landscape, system approval, and relevant charter party clauses, which Helen's going to elaborate on throughout Helen's part of the presentation. Another point I want to bring to your attention for those that haven't got the experience of this in the background is the well to wake analysis. And this is extremely important. Um, the IMO is, is recently announced that it's slightly changing its stance on this, so they will be looking at it at a well to wake basis as opposed to just a tank to wake basis, which is great in our opinion. And the EU ETS and fuel EU maritime will also be looking on a well to wake basis. The, that just to give an analogy, it's a bit like driving an electric car and it's great looking at the low emissions that it's producing at that moment in time. But if the production techniques were very fossil fuel dependent, then that has a major impact. And it's the same applied to shipping. You know, for example, hydrogen and ammonia have no carbon atoms. But if fossil fuels are used to produce them, then when you look at the analysis as a whole, then it's going to have a major impact. And this is where biofuels you'll probably see come to the forefront a little bit more because on the well to wake analysis, they're, they're more favorable as we go through this next period. But there's a lot to be decided there, so a lot of change ahead here. I just want to bring you to your attention on navigating decarbonization page. Ian touched on this before, but we've got a website freely available, freely open to everybody. You can have a look at our material there. And we run a series of webinars and you know the recordings are available as well. Um, and there's plenty of information there, plenty of topics. And we have Signals Magazine, which is released regularly in electronic format too. So next part of this, I really want to set the scene with a bit of a uh, a working example and um, call it a case study work example what you like um, and I'm setting the scene with this so that later on Helen will delve it into it in a little bit more detail and explain how it goes. So what we're looking at here is a hypothetical shipping company called Carbon Traders Limited and the owners of a following fleet of 634,000 deadweight bulk carriers 2012 built 556,000 deadweight oil tankers built in 2010 and five 3,500 TEU container vessels built in 2007. Owners have undertaken AXI benchmarking for the bulk carrier sister ships and are in the process of EAXI benchmarking for the tankers and container ships. Owners are now considering the impact the EEXI and CAI requirements may have on their charter parties. So, scenario one, the bulk carrier JCs, 34,000 deadweight, built 2012. It's approaching the end of its current charter party. 
and the new long-term charter party spans 2023, which is the important point here, because 2023 is not only applicable to the EEXI, it's also applicable to the CII, which starts on the 1st of January 2023 as well. Owners need to negotiate the new GP with the EEXI and CII in mind, and EEXI benchmarking suggests following the IEEC, power limitation, 75% MCR, and energy saving devices. And for the CII, owners wish to ensure they can operate the vessel to meet these requirements. The next scenario is a, a tanker, 156,000 dead weight, built 2010, and the owners usually buy a chart of the tanker, including MLCs. The intention is to make the vessel modifications to meet EEXI between charter parties. And the owners are keen to address operational measures in the charter party by discussing with charters. Scenario three is a container ship. Turquoise seas, 3,500 TEU, built 14 years ago in 2007. Long-term charter party spanning 2023 again, and the existing charter party, an important point here, doesn't cater for EEXI and CII. And I think Helen will probably have a little smile as I say that because she's receiving a lot, Helen's receiving a lot of questions on this particular point lately. Charter has proposed the use of biofuel, just to give you a bit of background there and just to give you the different angle there. So the next slide now is really bringing this together and we like to use the chicken and egg scenario because we're getting these questions quite a bit from ship owners and what we really want to say is that the EEXI benchmarking or the charter party and, and which one do you look at first and we're always referring to the EEXI benchmarking. We always suggest that the ship owners look into the EEXI benchmarking in advance and then they use that to then decide on the charter parties. Then they can come to ourselves and, and Helen and the FD&D department within North and look at the charter party. And this next slide is perhaps the most important and what we'd like to bring forward, and that's really to act now. That, and that's what we're trying to urge ship owners around the world to do as, as far in advance as possible. We saw it with IMO 2020, where some ship owners left it a little bit too late and they were pushed into a corner. And that's not what we're going to see happening here. The ship owners who act earliest will give themselves the most choice. And that's really what it's about. So with that, I'm going to hand over the next part, the nuts and bolts, the technical part of the presentation, and perhaps Keegan and Satiris would say the most interesting part of the presentation. I'm going to hand over that now to Keegan and allow them to keep you fascinated for the next part of this presentation. Th thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Th thank you very much, Mark. You're, you're quite generous. Um, cer certainly uh, your observations and perspective on managing uh, overall decarbonization risk are, are very insightful. Um, from a class perspective, uh, you know, we, we want to really focus on sort of the regulatory uh, drivers and the uh, and the technical elements. So as a reminder, my name is Keegan Plascon. I'm the uh, ABS Business Development Director and Account Manager uh, here in North America. I'm based in the, uh, uh, in the Eastern uh, District uh, in the Mid-Atlantic region, um, and I'm excited to uh, to be joining you all today. Um, from a class perspective, I think it's really important for everyone to understand that uh, uh, the emerging landscape for owners and operators is really driven by four leading elements uh, that, that pose significant challenges to the industry. Uh, primarily, uh, it, it, the regulatory um, component uh, is really around the, IM, the IMO's long-term GHG reduction strategy for uh, 2030 and 2050 compliance. Uh, of course, combined with the short-term measures uh, that we know under EEXI and CII, and they're posing quite stringent requirements on the global fleet, most of which will have to will be, be impacted and need to take action. Um, in addition to that, also there are financial institutions uh, that have supporting new buildings and other retrofits or, or just standard financing, and they have established certain frameworks like the Poseidon principles in order to track carbon intensity uh, uh, and the performance of those vessels within their portfolio. Um, Next, certainly we've spoken about charters, uh, charterers and charter party agreements, and, and they're following a very similar initiative, uh, such as alliances like the Sea Cargo Charter, uh, which aims to really track the carbon intensity of, the, uh, of, of their members and the member vessels. 
Um, and really, finally, uh, there are uh, emerging market-based measures uh, such as bunker levies or carbon levies in the emissions trading system, such as the one being established in the EU. Uh, you know, clearly the combination of these programs uh, creates a very challenging landscape for the marine sector and addressing these challenges will, will re require a joint industry wide effort. Today, our, our focus will be on the regulatory and technical elements uh, that comprise the Marpole Annex 6 amendments that are that are upcoming. At this point, I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague, Soterios Mamalis, uh, to provide more technical details uh, and uh, take us through the uh, uh, next part of our presentation. Soterios? Um... Thank you, Keegan, and thank you, Mark, for making a nice introduction into your discussion today. Hi, everybody. I'm Soterios Mamalis. I'm the manager of the of the ABS sustainability team in Houston, and uh, I'll spend some time to to discuss with you the the intricacies of EXI and CII, as was uh, forwarded by Mark earlier. So the the the, the most important thing that you need to keep in mind is that the EXI and the CII are the shorter measures that were introduced by IMO to essentially pave the way to meeting the 2030 carbon intensity reduction milestone, which is the first milestone in the IMO greenhouse gas reduction strategy. So the the EXI will will apply retroactively to all vessels in um, in the global fleet. Uh, under specific categories and uh, and the purpose is to to serve like an equivalent EDI but for for existing vessels this will be a one time certification and it will be enforced starting november 1st to uh, 2022 in the following years every vessel uh, subject to the CII to the carbon intensity um, indicator regulations will have to show that from one year to the next, uh, their carbon intensity is reduced, and this will take us all the way to 2030. And uh, this will be um, this will be again applied, you know, to all vessels in uh, under specific specific categories uh, in in the global fleet. And the purpose is to show that uh, by 2030 we have achieved a 40% reduction in carbon intensity compared to the year 2008. Again, that's the first milestone of uh, of the IMO long-term greenhouse gas reduction strategy. So as you can imagine, we have uh, basically two challenges in front of us. The first one is the EXI, the second one is the CII, and we like to describe them using the using the iceberg analog. The EXI is really the first one that we'll have to that we'll have to that we will encounter. And um, although it is a one-time certification, it, uh, there are certain challenges associated with this, such as missing information or interpretations or calculation, especially for older for older vessels. The challenge of um, of calculating the reference speed that goes into these EXI calculations, and of course, collecting all the supporting documentation again, especially for older vessels that do not have an EDI technical file. And finally, any changes that need to be made you know, to the vessels to comply with the EXI regulations and come in direct conflict with any of their operational needs. So these are really the challenges associated with EXI. However, CII, we believe that comes with, uh, with uh, even higher challenges simply because it is a self-improvement and continuous monitoring exercise. So from one year to the next, Every vessel that uh, that is operated will have to show a reduction in the carbon intensity. And in the following slides, I will show you, I will show you the exact details from uh, from from year to year. Therefore, the CII uh, mandates, you know, annual data collection, reporting, and verification, which um, which of course will be done through uh, through IMO, but also mandates effective solutions. That requires effective solutions that uh, reduce the actual carbon intensity, the actual carbon emissions of uh, of the vessels. Now let's uh, start with the EXI and describe the the framework in a little bit more detail. So as we mentioned uh, briefly, the EXI is analogous to EDI, the Energy Efficiency Design Index, but it will be applied retroactively to all vessels in in the global fleet that fall under these specific categories that I will show you later on. So the concept is that uh, each one of these existing vessels will um, go through this energy efficiency calculation and um, the attained EXI number of this vessel will be compared against the regulated standards. If the vessel meets these uh, standards, if the vessel is compliant, then it will receive an international energy efficiency certificate and then it will proceed with its mission. However, 
if the vessel does not meet the required standards, then it will have to implement some efficiency improvement options. And this can be something relatively simple, like an engine power limitation or a shaft power limitation, or something more elaborate, like installation of an energy saving device, or something even more elaborate, like, like using a new fuel uh, with all the retrofits that, uh, that are required. If none of these options are sufficient, uh, to meet, uh, to make the vessel compliant with the with the regulations, then will have to be uh, will probably have to be scrapped and replaced with uh, with a new vessel. So this is really the framework behind behind the EXI. Now, the the EXI is applied to specific categories, which are shown here in uh, in this table. For example, bulk carriers of ten thousand uh, uh, GT and above. Same thing with tankers. As you can see here, we have combination carriers gas carriers and LNG carriers, container ships, general cargo ships, refrigerated cargo carriers, roros, and cruise passenger ships. So we have a large fraction really of the global fleet that is subject to these EXI regulations. So these apply to ships uh, under uh, category A of the stat code system, so cargo carrying does not apply to, to OSVs. Now, it is important to, to know that uh, the EXI regulations refer to an EDI reference line. So this is really the reference line that uh, that we use to, to, to define the reductions required in order to make the vessels compliant. And for each one of these vessel, vessel categories that we discussed in the previous slide, there is one reference line that has been defined by IMO. And really the formulas and the coefficients are shown, are shown in this table. Therefore, based on this EDI reference line for each one of these vessel categories, the IMO has uh, has mandated certain reduction factors um, that um, that will be will be required to be achieved so that each vessel becomes compliant. For example, if we look at the bulk carriers over here, for those that are 200,000 dead weight and above, the the IMO requires that they achieve a reduction factor of 15% compared to the EDI reference line that is defined. And this really the EDI reference line corresponds to the phase zero EDI that was introduced um, back in 2000, back in 2013. So same thing uh, holds with tankers, combination carriers, gas carriers, energy carriers, and all the other vessel segments. And you can see here that uh, in each one of these vessel segments, depending on, on the dead weight, we have a different reduction factors. You can see that some of these reduction factors, you know, vary. For example, the Roros have reduction factors of zero to five percent, which are relatively low. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, you can see that the large container ships have reduction factors of forty-five or fifty percent compared to their EDI reference lines, and this has to really to do with them. Um, with the differences in in design and the, the propulsion systems of uh, of these of these different vessels, therefore the IMO understands that some of these vessels may have an easier job to do when they have to comply with the EXI regulations than others. This is really uh, the reason behind all the different reduction factors that you see here. And um, and just to give you an example, we have uh, we have performed some calculations of uh, of vessels, you know, from from the ABS database. Uh, different uh, here. I'm showing an, uh, some examples of different tankers, bulk carriers, and container ships um, of different sizes and if in and here of build. These are all uh, these are all vessels that uh, are not compliant with EXI, and we have evaluated the actual engine power limitation needed in order to to make them compliant. Essentially, down speeding these vessels to make them compliant. From ABC 76, um, the 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 IMO. Uh, approved the the complete EXI calculation and uh, verification framework, and in fact they they specify two different approaches when uh, when engine power limitation is applied to a vessel. Um, the first approach is that when we apply a in a fixed power limitation, then the the EXI is uh, is calculated at seventy five percent of the MCR limited of the limited. Uh, maximum continuous rating of, of the engine, whereas if um, if uh, the ship owner, the operator chooses to apply an overridable power limitation, then the EXI is calculated at 83% of the limited MCR of the engine. And you can see over here that for some of these vessels, the engine power limitation needed is, is relatively low, like this bulk carrier from 2013 of 7.7%. 7 
in in the first approach. However, for for some other vessels, the engine power limitations can be quite substantial. For example, this container ship from 2007 uh, small feeder that requires 37 percent uh, engine power limitation, which is which is quite substantial. So this is uh, this is an exercise that really needs to be performed for every vessel subject to the EXI regulation, and this is something that's actively been pursued from uh, from ABS as well as other class societies, and even by the the ship owners and operators by themselves to understand exactly where their fleet stands. At the end of the, of this exercise, uh, the the, there is an EXI technical file that needs to be prepared. This technical file includes specific information about the vessel, uh, the, the vessel specifications, for example, its propulsion, the electric power supply system, the an actual description of how this reference speed of the vessel or the speed power curve was uh, was obtained, detailed description of any energy saving equipment as uh, they have been installed on the vessel and as they they apply towards the calculation of its CXI at the DXI, then the actual calculation and finally documented speed power curve and other parameters that go into the EXI calculation. This is also something that's uh, that's prepared by ABS and and the class societies and essentially completes that exercise of um, of assessing a vessel against the EXI regulations. Now, if we shift gears and uh, and move into CII, you will um, you will see what I mentioned previously. Why we think that the, the CII is actually more challenging than the EXI. In in a nutshell, starting from uh, 2023 as uh, as the first year. The, the IMO mandates you know, annual reductions in carbon intensity of, um, of vessels in service uh, that fall under specific categories, and I'll show you exactly what these are in the, in the following slides. And um, after each year, after the end of each year, every vessel will have to report its fuel consumption to the IMO through the IMO data collection system. Then the IMO, based on this fuel consumption, will calculate the actual carbon intensity of every vessel. And based on its carbon intensity, every vessel will receive a score from A to E, with A being the best and E being E being the worst. Based on um, based on what was approved at MEPC 76, the IMO will allow a rating of E for one year or a rating of D for three consecutive years uh, for a vessel before some action uh, before some actions need to be taken that will reduce the carbon intensity of that of that vessel. And of course, uh, when a vessel is compliant, you will receive a statement of compliance within five months of uh, of its uh, of its calendar year. Um, if a vessel is rated D or E and needs to um, needs to present a corrective action plan, which needs to be documented in the ship energy efficiency management plan, as you can see here for for the following years. Now, the um, the vessels, uh, the vessel segments that are subject to the to the CII regulations are shown right here. These are similar to those shown previously for for EXI. So again, we're talking about bulk carriers, tankers, combination carriers, gas carriers, container ships, and and the rest of these categories. And of course, we have a reference line for CII that's defined uh, using this uh, this exponential factor with the with the with the two with the two parameters given over here defined by IMO. And those are different for each one of these vessel segments. Uh, one of the important outcomes of MPC 76 was the reduction rates from one year to the next. And uh, after quite a bit of a debate, it was decided that this will be implemented in three different phases. So currently we have approved reduction factors for phase one and two. And as you can see here, phase one will be from 2020 to 2022. And then phase two will kick in all the way to 2026. We still have not defined these reduction factors for phase three, but we know that until 2026, the reductions in carbon density needs to reach 11 percent compared to compared to 2019. So this is this is quite substantial, 11 percent uh, reductions carbon density, and of course it needs to happen either with a direct reduction in fuel consumption. Or maybe with uh, with the use of uh, of alternative fuels. Now, for each one of these uh, vessel segments, the IMO has also defined the way to calculate the ratings. So there's no universal way of calculating these ratings, but in fact they're they're specific to the vessel segments. And as you can see here, based on the average, which is the required CII for a given year, 
there are these factors D1 to D4 that essentially define, you know, these ratings and all these coefficients have also been given and approved by, by IMO. The, it, the, the importance of CII was, was, was evident to us when we performed, again, some example calculations based on, based on data for vessels that are, that are available in the ABS database. And I want to show you a couple of examples here, examples here of anonymized vessels. But uh, we started by taking an example fleet of 80 tanker vessels of, of a wide range of, uh, of sizes and year of build. And uh, we wanted to, to basically perform this exercise to show how these ratings change from one year to the next. So if you look at the table on the left first, you can see that uh, starting from 2023 going all the way to 2030, with assumed you know, reduction factors be beyond 2026, we see some of these vessels that are very good. So they start with an, with an A rating for their CII, but they quickly transition to B after a few years or some of these vessels that start from B and transition to C, C to D, and finally like D to E. And of course, we had like a vessel over here that started with an E and really was uh, it was kept at E, you know, for the for the remaining years. This shows, of course, that even if a vessel is currently compliant and it's well designed, it's operated efficiently, it's an efficient vessel. Simply because of these uh, required reductions, carbon intensity, soon there will be actions that need to be taken so that this vessel can continue to be compliant, you know, in the following years, all the way to 2030 or even beyond beyond 2030, depending on how the regulations evolve. And this is also shown using this um, this bar chart on on the left. We here for the same example fleet of of 80 tankers, we have basically calculated percentages of these vessels with an A rating, B, C, D, or E ratings. And as you can see, starting from 2023, there is, a, there is uh, only like 3% of these vessels are rated with an E. But as the years go by, this, uh, this, um, pers this fraction increases all the way to 23% at, uh, at 2030. So again, even if a vessel is, is very efficient currently, you know, performs well, gets, uh, gets a good uh, CII rating, soon enough uh, we will reach a point that, um, that some action needs to be taken in order to, to keep this vessel compliant with, uh, with the CII regulation, which is really the, 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 the major challenge be behind, this, uh, behind this regulation. Because of this, we've, um, we have performed an exercise of it's basically statistical analysis to understand what fraction of the global fleet will be affected by EXI and CI regulations. And as you might expect, there is a large fraction of the fleet that is affected. Here I'm just showing some, uh, some, um, some highlights. We expect that 87% of the bulk carriers will be affected by the EXI regulations, meaning that they will have to implement some efficiency improvement option even an EPL, engine power limitation. Same thing holds with container ships, 88%, tankers, 85%, gas carriers, 95%. So again, a large fraction of the global fleet affected by CII. And really, we see the same, the same picture when we, when we analyze the, the, the CII, large fraction of the bulk carriers, 86% 80, container ships, tankers, gas carriers, and LNG carriers affected by CII regulations. So we expect that a lot of, uh, a lot of these vessels will have to undergo through the process of our assessing their uh, their EXI and the CII performance and plan ahead you know so that they can be compliant with uh, with these regulations and this uh, this planning ahead really is uh, starts from benchmarking a, a fleet prioritizing the vessels with the low ratings, meaning the vessels that have the highest needs you know for improvement options and understanding what these improvement options are, and how they can be how they can be implemented because some of these can can take a, a substantial amount of time, and once these are documented and understood, then the ship energy efficiency management plan needs to be updated and approved by January first, uh, twenty twenty three. When all these things are done, then the vessel can continue its operation, and of course, in the future, in order to comply with the CI regulations, it has to continue with data collection, reporting to the IMO data collection system, and verifying receiving statement of compliance and then continuing this corrective action plan until uh, until things um, uh, things are the way they should be for compliance with CII. 
So this, uh, this of course, creates challenges for for a lot of ship owners and operators. You know, in the in on a global scale, there are new regulations with areas that require interpretation. In fact, you know, from IMO, we still do not have the finalized framework for CIA regulations. We expect that this will be done in the following MBPC meetings, 77 and 78. Um, it is important to assess these vessels, you know, for EXI and CII, simply because some of these requirements for increasing efficiency contradict the the requirements, of, and you know that uh, that are part of charter parts of charter party agreements. So that's uh, that's something that needs to be optimized. We've seen a lack of uh, information available, especially for older tonnage. And this uh, this makes things a little bit more difficult when we try to assess these older older vessels, you know, against the EXI regulations. And also, we've seen cases of vessels that have received retrofits that have not been verified. So that's also something that needs, need to we need to go back and uh, and and do. Finally, we need to understand, you know, the the impact of various energy saving devices and energy efficiency technologies. Some of these are still in the research and development phase, so they're difficult to quantify their impact. This is something that will definitely have to be done, especially some of these technologies and solutions, uh, you know, are chosen for implementation of certain vessels. And finally, of course, you know, work with the class societies to prepare the EXI technical file and all the supporting documentation so that these vessels are ready for for 2023. So with that, I'd like to close my part of the presentation and thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them later. Thank you very much. So Tyrius, just while you're there, um, I think Ravi's um, raised his hand there. Um, I'm just going to, um, I've, I've asked for to type the question, but I'm just going to allow the microphone here. Uh, Ravi, can you just ask your question now, please? You should, you may be able to speak now. Okay. Okay, anyway, if you could type your question, then we'll we'll try and get back to the question later on uh, once Helen has done has uh, spoken on her part. Thank you very much, thank you. Um, thanks very much uh, to Ian and to Mark Keegan and Satirius for their introductions and presentations. Um, I'm now going to talk, look through the charter party considerations and we'll use the hypothetical carbon traders case study already outlined by Mark earlier and I'll turn to that shortly. But first, um, just due to there being so many variables with the different vessel types, um, specifications, ages, etc. And due to the different options available at present to reduce carbon emissions, whether from a technical point of view or from an operational perspective, and the varying views on what will be on the horizon to meet the ultimate goal of net zero emissions, there is no one size fits all or silver bullet when it comes to what owners and charterers should be doing to meet their decarbonisation obligations or their own decarbonisation strategies for that matter. Because of these variables, the way in which the issues are going to be reflected in charter parties will obviously vary. Charters want to be able to operate the ship in a manner that suits them best. So as soon as we're looking at modifications to vessels or power limitation or restricting how a vessel can be operated, it's going to cut across the rights and obligations in charter parties. It's therefore really important that parties review how the costs and risks of complying with the regulations will be allocated in the charter parties. The only way in which the IMO targets are going to be achieved in the industry will be with the engagement of all stakeholders, including both owners and charterers, and Ian um, touched upon that earlier. So while, for example, limiting a vessel's power is going to cut across the charterer's use of the vessel, it is expected that owners and charterers will try and work together, um, albeit there's always going to be commercial considerations that require careful negotiation. Um, Mark, Satirios and Keegan have already spoken about the need to consider EXI benchmarking before properly considering what charter party clauses need amending. And this is to allow for as much clarity in the charter party drafting as possible. In the event of clauses being too general or not covering all of the risks, then this can ultimately lead to disputes. To illustrate this, I'm now going to turn to the case study outlined by Mark. Um, I should flag at this point that 
the case study and the scenarios are all hypothetical and consider just some of the points that um, may need to be addressed. And obviously addressing any technical and operational changes to charter parties will require consideration of a charter party as a whole um, and of all of the relevant clauses in the charter party. Um, and I just note as well, I'm looking at this from an English law perspective. So turning to the first scenario, and to recap, um, we have the Jade Seas. E EEXI benchmarking has been carried out for this ship and suggests the following for IEE certification. Power limitation at 75% MCR and installation of energy saving devices. The Jade Seas is currently um, under time charter, which will shortly be coming to an end. And the new charter party um, to be entered into will span 2023. And so needs to be negotiated with both EEXI and CII in mind. In terms of power limitation, whether by engine power limitation or shaft power limitation, the following points should um, be considered within the charter party. The vessel's description and speed and consumption warranties may need to be amended. And in the event the EPL or Shapley modification is to take place during the course of the charter party, then provision needs to be included to provide for owner's right to do this, as well as inclusion of the right to correct the vessel description and any charter party speed and consumption warranties and other clauses due to the EPL and Shapley, modif or Shapley modification. For the installation of energy saving devices, unless any other agreement is reached with the charterers, the time and cost of installation will usually be for owner's account. As for the um, charter party provisions, the following should be borne in mind. So the time to carry out the required modifications, including provision allowing for a vessel to deviate to dry dock if that's going to be necessary. Um, provisions dealing with maintenance might need to be amended. And also, as with power limitation, the vessel's description and warranties, such as speed and consumption, may also need to be revised to account for the efficiencies given by the energy saving devices. From a charterer's perspective, charterers may want to understand their rights um, and remedies in the event that owners fail to meet the required EEXI um, and fail to obtain the IEE certification. Therefore, a question arises, if owners fail to meet the required EXI and don't obtain an IEE certification, could charterers cancel the charter party? Um, an example clause is clause six of the NYP 2015, and that requires that owners provide all documentation and maintain it during the charter party. And this is a fairly pr uh, common provision in charter parties. This clause doesn't stipulate itself that it is a condition of the contract, which would mean that any fail failure by the owners in this regard would allow charterers to breach the charter party, uh, would allow charterers to terminate the charter party, sorry. Um, and so it's likely to be what we call an innominate term. And so consideration would need to be given as to the severity of the consequence of the breach and whether it goes to the root of the contract. Obviously, not having the IEE certificate is going to impact upon a vessel's trade. And so it's going to depend upon the facts and circumstances, whether the breach will allow the charterers to terminate. As for the options owners are intending to implement for achieving the uh, CII requirement, owners wish to encourage charterers to avoid long stays in port and implement just in time principles. As well as improving efficiencies in terms of um, bunker savings, it's also preferable from a whole fouling perspective. And the BIMCO slow steaming clause for time charter parties 2011 could be considered here. Under the charter party terms, it's likely that the vessel will need to proceed using, for example, utmost dispatch. Um, and there may be a failure to prosecute a voyage with utmost dispatch, where without good reason, the master sails at a reduced speed or takes a route other than the shortest and the quickest. However, in some cases, it may be that the shortest route between two points is not actually the most fuel efficient route because of currents or wave heights or winds, etc. And so owners um, in this case want to include an express right for them to proceed using the most fuel efficient route. The already mentioned BIMCO slow steaming clause um, complements this need um, as it provides that the owner shall exercise due diligence to minimise fuel consumption. Um, and such due, due diligence includes making use of weather routing and voyage optimization and performance monitoring systems. 
and also notes that owners compliance with the clause wouldn't be considered a breach of the dispatch obligation. Again, as with the EXI requirements from a charterer's perspective for the CII, the charterers may want some certainty as regards the vessel CII uh, rating during the currency of the charter and perhaps what remedies are available to them if the vessel CII rating drops. However, that's going to be a commercial discussion between owners and charterers because how operationally efficient a vessel is does depend to a large extent on how the charterers order the master to operate the ship. So now I will turn to the next scenario of the Emerald Seas. And as Mark mentioned, um, the owners of this uh, vessel usually charter out their um, tanker vessels directly. Um, and that's the case for the Emerald Seas too. Therefore, because the ship will not be under a long charter, it makes it easier for the owners to deal with any vessel, vessel modifications to meet the EXI requirements between charter parties. That said, obviously, owners do need to be mindful that any power limitation, etc., cetera, uh, would need to be addressed in any charter party vessel description and warranties and relevant clauses following the modifications. Uh, owners are keen to address operational measures um, to reduce emissions in their voyage charters and want to start introducing these with their charterers now. So in terms of voyage charters, there are certain legal obligations that don't necessarily encourage fuel efficiency. An example of this is the obligation on the owners to proceed to the load port with due dispatch. Now, demurrage itself is obviously an indicator of inefficiency um, and it's not fuel efficient to have, a, have to proceed at an excessive speed um, only to have the vessel wait once she arrives at the port uh, for a berthing slot. However, without express wording in the voyage charter to address this, the owners would be in breach of their dispatch obligation and charters would be able to claim damages. Furthermore, the consideration of fuel efficient voyages um, shouldn't stop just with the loading port and should also be extended to the discharge port and interim ports as well. Here, the BIMCO just in time arrivals clause 2021 um, could be considered as, as well as the BIMCO port call data exchange clause. It's obviously um, understood that a charterer's ability to use just in time principles um, depends upon whether the port itself is set up that way um, but it's hoped that um, in more time ports will have better infrastructure to accommodate for just-in-time arrivals. As mentioned earlier the ability to proceed to the most fuel efficient route could also be provided for um, in the charter party. And turning to the uh, final scenario of the turquoise seas the vessel here is under a long-term charter and will span 2023. EXI benchmarking is being undertaken and so the measures owners will use in this regard aren't yet known, although owners are aware that, they, that this will need to be addressed in their charter parties in due course. The out, because the outcome of the EXI benchmarking is not yet known, that's not being addressed with charters at this stage, but the charters have proposed the use of biofuels. And so um, consideration needs to be given to the charter party um, where biofuels are going to be used. And some of the provisions that could be um, could require consideration include um, all clause re clauses relating to bunkers, including bunker quality and specification clauses, as well as bunker price and bunkers on delivery and re-delivery clauses. Um, the specification of the biofuel will need to be set out in the charter party. There is no standard specification for biofuels. Um, ISO 8217 is a fossil fuel standard, and whilst it could be used as, for guidelines, um, there are missing parameters relevant to biofuels and others which aren't actually relevant. So from a charter party perspective, if biofuels are to be used, then wording could be um, included, for example, that the charters are to provide for biofuels of a quality and specification uh, which are approved by the engine manufacturer and also a requirement to provide the certificate of quality um, and sustainability certificate as well. The performance warranty should also be reviewed and if necessarily, if um, necessary amended, biofuels use a bit more fuel than fossil fuel for the same propulsion and so that needs to be addressed. And um, also potentially, in, potential inclusion of a tank cleaning clause 
cleaning of tanks from previous fuels may be prudent to prevent compatibility problems. And if there are any quality concerns, it's obviously easier to prove when a clean tank has been used from the outset. Consideration should also be given to what will happen in the event of loss of time or cost being incurred as a result of the biofuel uh, use or trial. Um, and finally, consideration of whether alternative fuels may need to be provided in the event of non-availability of the agreed biofuel and how that will be um, agreed in the charter party. Uh, that brings me to an end of the points I was planning to address in respect of the case study scenarios. But as mentioned earlier, any amendments to charter parties relating to technical or operational changes um, should be considered as a whole in, the, in terms of the charter party and all of the relevant clauses considered. Um, of course, if members have any queries or require any assistance in relation to the drafting of EXI or CII clauses, then um, don't hesitate to contact me or your usual FD&D contact or the decarbonisation group. Um, just finally, I've put the BIMCO clauses that I've referred to in the Carbon Traders case study on this slide um, for ease of reference, but I will now pass back to Mark for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you. Um, and if if all the other panelists could just open up the video now, please, and uh, we'll just go through the the questions that we've got. Um, thank you very much, Helen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Keegan, Satirius, Ian, everybody. Great presentation. Um, nice to see how it all knits together. Uh, very interesting, and and it's it's been very informative uh, as a whole. We had one question, um, which I'm just going to read out uh, quickly, and that was taken before, which was uh, the first question was to do with time frames for implementation and penalties for non-conformance. We've covered off the time frame for implementation being 2023, and th that's the message we're trying to get across to act now. Um, penalties for non-conformance. There's more to be decided on this, and and that's a, a continuing theme throughout this. That you know, the IMO hasn't really made all the decisions that are required yet, so we're waiting. Possibly at MEPC 77, but we can't guarantee for more notice on that. So um, stay tuned, as we say, because we'll be having a webinar following up from MEPC 77. Um, the next question, I want to try and keep to the contractual questions first, if it's OK, because um, Helen's under a little bit of a time penalty. So um, I'm just going to point a question to you, Helen, that was asked was was more about the um, charity party considerations from a ship's financial perspective. I know you've covered it um, in some part throughout your part of the presentation, but just to hear your thoughts on that, please, Helen, that would be great. Thanks, Mark. Um, yep. Yeah, so obviously I've considered it really from owner and charter of perspective um it's perhaps a bit difficult to answer this without a bit of a better understanding of the question um but i would have thought that ship from a ship financier side um, they're going to want to ensure that owners continue to receive higher from um the charterers so that owners can obviously meet their finance obligations so from a ship financier perspective it's going to be preferable to, for owners to address these issues in their charter parties to avoid as far as possible um, any breach by owners which could result in financial um, penalties such as damages. Um, in addition, we understand that um, financiers are also interested in certain industry initiatives and transparent reporting by owners and charterers of emissions um, so that these can be aligned to decarbonisation goals. An example of this is the Sea Cargo Charter, which um, Keegan briefly mentioned earlier, um, which provides a global framework that enables ship owners, charters and cargo owners to align their activities and promote um, sh shipping's green transition. So in that regard, it allows for a transparent process to report emissions. And from a ship financier's perspective, um, I would have thought that such initiatives would be encouraged as it creates a dynamic um, between financiers and owners and charterers who are uh, where they are increasingly interested in financing responsible shipping. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. That's great. Um, just to answer that last question that's just come in. Um, yes, the 
um, the presentation slides will be made available to all attendees and a recording of this video when we get the editing process done, which can you know take it can take a few days just to get that in place. But we've done that. Um, we've got a few more questions that we're going to turn to, but I'm very conscious that Ravi um, asked a question a long time ago, so I, I don't think it's came into the chat now. What we do is we normally allow we block the microphones to stop background noise, but I'm I'm trying to allow um, Ravi to to um, to speak here, and hopefully Ravi should be able to unmute the microphone. If not, then please could you type your message into the the chat function, please, Ravi? As as I said earlier, we it's the way the Teams is set up that we that we block out the um, the the microphones to prevent background noise. So if not, we can follow up with Ravi afterwards. So the the next question I think that's coming in now is from Bob DeMotta, which is do these reduction requirements apply to government owned vessels? And perhaps Keegan Satiris would like to step in on that. And my understanding is as long as they meet a certain criteria, then it would apply to that as well. But uh, I'd, I'd like Keegan and, and Satiris to step in on that as well, just to back me up if anything. Or, so or so from I think from a larger perspective, uh, right, the uh, the regulatory framework in place for, uh, under IMO is really uh, targeted for commercial uh, type 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 of cargo you know, vessels and that uh, government owned assets, whether they're naval assets, uh, naval auxiliary assets or other types of government assets, many of those are outside of that uh, strict regulatory framework for commercial vessels. However, uh, there are uh, voluntary um, uh, compliance uh, regimes uh, that uh, that government agencies will adopt uh, for their for their particular vessels, and if they choose to maintain uh, statements of voluntary compliance or or SOC type of certificates, then then in that in order to maintain the validity of those certificates, they would then need to uh, take action to, uh, to to demonstrate compliance with the uh, Marpol amendments. Um, unless they were able to uh, come to an agreement with their uh, respective flag states, like in, in the United States, that would be the U.S. Coast Guard uh, around a uh, an alternative uh, type type of arrangement or or p potential case by case dispensation. OK, thank you. That's great. Thank you. Um, so the next question, uh, I think we've answered Bob and then Bob's question is, uh, so for AEXI, I do not have a C trial report with VREF on it. Can I run a new sea trial to obtain VREF or am I required to use the formula approach to determine the VREF in this case? I think that's a question for Satirius really um, with respect to the VREF because you will have seen quite a few of these so far, I'd imagine. Sure, yeah, you can definitely, you know, run new C trials. IMO understands that uh, this may not be easy in some cases. This is why they have uh, allowed the numerical calculation of the reference speed. But absolutely, if uh, if somebody is interested in performing new C trials, it can be done. And in fact, recently, I've heard prices from uh, from Chinese companies, Chinese contractors, on the order of like ten to twenty thousand dollars for for new C trials. Okay, thank you. That's excellent. Okay, I'm just going to try Ravi one more time and see if I can get Ravi to. Um, Ravi, you should be able to activate your microphone or type in the chat. If not, I think we'll just uh, reach out to you separate to this and, uh, and and contact you because I'm sure your question will still remain valid. Um, and I think that really is the end to the questions that have been asked. We're about 10 minutes over on the time now, which is good. You know, we've had some good questions. Um, and I think I think we'll unless there's any more questions to be asked, we'll get in touch with Ravi after the presentation and, and contact Ravi for for that particular question. Would anybody else like to say anything before we go? I'd just like to thank everyone for attending and thank uh, thank Keegan Satarius, Helen and yourself, Mark, for for presenting. We look forward to a follow up to this at some point in time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Cheers. Thanks. Right, Bye. Bye.